Right, I'm ready to begin, but I think the clock is ready to begin as well. So we'll do that. Uh, welcome to this talk. Um, and it's about uh, several uh, things that come together. It's about implementation, and in this case, then, um, this graphical um, toolkit, GTK, and how it can be used. Uh, GTK exists already and is the basis of the known desktop environment, so many people use it anyway. So this uh, way of writing software, the graphical way of programming, is turning programming upside down because um, it's called event-driven programming and in event-driven programming there is a main loop uh, which you are generally not in control of, it is in fact your environment that manages that and um, all you do is get to write the subroutines. That's rather the opposite of how you might otherwise program where the libraries contain the subroutines and you call them. Um, well, there is a hybrid going on because when these events call you, in turn, you may again call other things in the library to draw a box on the screen or whatever else you'd like to have happen. So there's back and fro, um, to and fro calling going on. Um, but uh, events do take some different dealing with, and uh, many languages call this a callback. And so the, when the callback occurs, uh, your program has to say, if the following event occurs, here's the address we'd like you to call. So you're passing the address of the subroutine to the library, and then you're letting the library do its main thing. So we have that, uh, for example, in our um, user GUI programs uh, with the following types of events. Uh, there will be others too. You can think of uh, network communication uh, as another kind of I.O., so uh, web service receiving packets, etc. If you can program things in an event-driven way, it tends to be very efficient. And so uh, there are event-driven <coughs> environments also in Perl 5. I can think of the POE. The, uh, that's a, an example of lots of modules that uh, implement that kind of handler. We're not there yet with Perl 6, but this is showing a way forward and um, an early implementation of those ideas. We haven't had much in the way of callbacks so far, and I've been itching to do this kind of thing, and I was very happy when uh, a few months ago uh, this arrived in the first Perl 6 implementation to have it. And so we'll look at that uh, a little bit more. Here's an example of the sort of code I mean uh, for a callback. Um, it is a delete event, you can read that. So when a delete occurs, we're specifying the subroutine. So I apologize for the Perl 6 syntax if you're not used to that, but um, it isn't that different from Perl 5. You can see in this case uh, some niceties such as the named parameters instead of the old at underscore and a few other things. Um, going back to the application, that's telling it that you want to shut down and so that is this calling a second time. And you're calling back to a library to say, right, that's it, I've had enough out of here. And that's how we shut the thing down. Um, later, so uh, after some more code, this run is in fact where you surrender control of uh, the events to the library. The library, after that point, is in charge. And your program has done its thing. It's set up callback handlers. There will be more callback handlers, not only this simple one. But uh, once they've all been programmed, then you say run, and your program effectively stops running. It's done everything. And our GTK, GTK takes over. So GTK is in charge. That contains the run method, and so on. Now, there's a, a certain amount of glue necessary to uh, hang all this together, particularly to get it from Perl 6 uh, into GNOME. And so there's a long way between those, and uh, the glue is, of course, the magic that someone else can make. And I'm very glad they did. So uh, this one, in fact, uh, is built on this new Perl, Perl 6 implementation called Nietzsche. And just a little bit about it here. Uh, it's largely the product of one developer, one fairly young man in California, who's a brilliant programmer to have pulled this off. He took the uh, standard std.pm from Larry Wall and uh, built a C-sharp implementation around that. So his main language was C-sharp for the low-level bits, and in Perl 6 tradition, the high-level bits are written in Perl 6. So it's a bit recursive. And uh, that implementation that he built up has grown in the last, uh, let's say, year and a half or so, uh, from being very experimental to being pretty serious and pretty usable as well. And the rate at which uh, features are being added is very impressive. Um, the spec test count, for example, uh, is now um, starting to look <coughs> similar to the spec test count of Rakuda, which has been in development for a lot longer, or Plugs, which has existed even longer. So uh, that Nietzsche is catching up is a very positive sign, of course. And um, 
yeah, you can see it's highly portable. Uh, there are occasionally, as you would have, uh, glitches with that, uh, some bit rot and so on. So I believe currently uh, certain mono versions weren't supported. I had some bit rot uh, just the other day, and a recent mono upgrade wouldn't, uh, wouldn't go with it. So I've held this laptop back, this netbook, to the old version to make sure I still had a running program to show you, because I want to do live demos. Okay, so that's a very good implementation of Perl 6. Um, uh, in fact, uh, what I was talking about earlier, uh, this is the top of that same source code file, so some more extract there. And you can see it comes from Mono in this case, and uh, calling GTK is what they expect to do a lot anyway. Uh, the second line of this listing is something that people would often do if they were programming in C-sharp. They would be dealing with things like this in the global assembly cache. So I'm speaking a little bit of uh, .NET there. Uh, referring to things with public key tokens and so on. And um, if you do that sort of work in your commercial other life, etc., then you'll be pleased to know that a lot of the .NET code is accessible from Perl 6 via this technique. So you obviously need the magic incantations of the exact right version number, the exact uh, public key token, etc. But you can find these things. There are tools like GACUtil that can help you. So this opens up the world of what is in the GAC, uh, which some of you will know, and uh, is all available. Uh, the rest then is setting up uh, these constants, I would think, are performing the purpose of an alias in this case. It's just some uh, name substitution, almost like a simple macro as well. And so they're not doing awfully much. And uh, then, yeah, to kick it off, uh, it was something to tell the libraries to wake up. And then, well, we read the rest on a previous slide. So that was the idea, and I want to show you the running. So we'll go to that. Um, to launch that one, that's the exact uh, invocation, and you'll see that Nietzsche does have, a, a, unfortunately, a fairly long startup time, but there's a little window, and um, it is well behaved. There's very little source code to this, um, but um, it's, a, it's a proper GUI application, and so this has a minimal one. There's your button, being what buttons should do, and it has its window title, and so on. Uh, just for reference, I'll reference the... Uh, source code. Uh, there it is. So you saw some of it in the slide. The entire listing is all of that. So we highlighted certain parts of it before. That's all. So there were a few more lines of glue around that, but that's it. So there's our little window. And when it's done, we click on the button, or you can close. And in this case, uh, whether you click the button or hit close, it's going to end in both cases. So we'll do a click, and there you can see it reported its result. So a perfectly well-behaved little Perl 6 program doing that. Uh, that's then the first example, and uh, back here then. A uh, bit <coughs> more about the background. Well, these are some of the places where you can uh, get information. Uh, so it's, it's Project uh, Mono, and um, also the known project has a lot of documentation. Uh, I found this one particularly useful, so if you do want to uh, explore what else is possible, um, these are the places to go to. Um, and this is just a short sampling. You can see many others uh, of the available resources. Um, if you know about GUIs, well, basically almost anything that GNOME can draw on the screen, uh, this should be able to draw on the screen as well. It's just a simple matter of programming. So uh, you just have to make lots more calls to create lots more drawing items. So the button was the simplest one. Uh, there's some examples of drawing, doing some graphics. Thank you. And um, here we can see uh, just a little bit more complicated source code. I don't want to bamboozle you with that. Um, just some other names to drop. You can see that Cairo is used, and uh, if people are doing graphics with other programming languages, they'll come across using the Cairo uh, language. Uh, they're, in fact, related to this lot, and so they're also available through the same system. And, in fact, this uh, CC over here, uh, it turns out that what you need is a Cairo context. And so that's one of the objects you have to create, and then uh, that stays in your um, parameters that you pass to other functions, that you say, do this on that Cairo context, which is a particular drawing surface. So uh, too much complexity, we won't read all that. Um, other things you can do, uh, time it ticks, that's another event. An event is that the clock ticks. Of course, it ticks uh, all the time, but what you want to do is specify how often you'd like to be called. Um, there's a thing in milliseconds, that number, of course, that would be once in a minute which would be good for my second demo, which is a little clock. And um, so we'll do that, and this time around I'll rather fire off the clock now because the startup time is a little slower. So we'll just do that and give it time to start up and carry on reading in the meantime. It'll pop up 
when it's ready. Um, but yeah, one of the things the clock, or well, the only thing the clock has to do, is tell the drawing area that um, that it needs to be redrawn. And um, when the clock ticks, uh, that is one minute later, it'll just say draw again. And so you can have the clock somewhere. And this is also a well-behaved little thing, so you can resize it. Oops, went away. It went very small. Too small. Come back. All is forgiven. So there's a small one. You can see it's also resizable text. No problem. Well, to my clock. Come back. <laughs> okay, there it is. And uh, yes, you can play with the graphics and. But the potential of this is, is very great. Uh, it must be to do with my way of handling things there. So that's working all right, and you'll see the clock tick, uh, hopefully, and, um, or take my word for it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that it does. So that's keeping time. Where is it gone? Okay. And it didn't uh, have another delete method. I didn't uh, add buttons to it or anything. Its source code is over here uh, as the clock. And it's a little bit bigger, of course, you can see a little bit more going on there. To get those Cairo libraries and so on, there's a few more uh, initial uh, aliases to set up. And then a bit more to figure out the hands of the clock and minor drawing details. And then uh, eventually there's the code that I highlighted and how to quit it. So you can just shut it down the same way. It doesn't print an exit message, it just closes. But that's well behaved as well. And um, having got the clock one to work, I was chatting with uh, a few code developers on the Perl 6 channel on IRC, and I said, well, you know, here's a challenge for you. Um, all you've got to do is be able to read the keyboard as well, and then you've got interactive games, because if a clock can move its hands, and you can sense when people are bashing the keyboard, you can make it animate and do things, and you can get it to respond to user input. Uh, just the the keyboard, but once you get that right, you get the mouse and whatever else. So it's a case of designing interactive games. So I figured out that Tetris would be a good choice, and hence the topic of the talk. And uh, that just goes into slightly more examples of things that you need to do. But the timeout is part of it. Uh, that's in milliseconds. If you want a reasonably animated game, just think of intervals that are shorter. So you've got to have uh, a few milliseconds only. I think I've got a few hundred milliseconds for the typical interactive delays. Um, and that's then basically firing interrupt events at the program, saying, okay, there's another time gone by, milliseconds gone by, move. And it's to tell the pieces to keep moving. So that's how that works. And, uh, okay, we see the clock now. And so about Tetris, um, yeah, that's the origin of the name. The, uh, at the time it was written, of course, tele-tennis was popular, and so this was a, a variant of the tele-tennis thought. And, um, Okay, the main idea of Tetris as a game is that it is a, obviously a series of uh, cells and pieces in those cells. Uh, the pieces occupy little square cells which are adjacent. And I managed to uh, work out the coordinates of all the cells in a piece. And uh, they're named, actually it was so nice to see Carl's talk earlier because he used the same pentomino names such as the letters of the alphabet that have the similar shape. They do that in Tetris a lot as well. And so uh, these are the letter uh, designations for the, uh, for the complete set of Tetris pieces of which you can count, there are just seven. Uh, so these are they and uh, they'll need some colors as well, so we give them some colors. And um, there was a little bit of unfortunate um, glue required here, which is the known data type. Uh, this was because the data type conversion in Perl 6 uh, bases uh, fractions on rational numbers, which are rats. And so they are just a denominator and numerator. And poor old C-sharp couldn't understand that. So they had to be turned into float, which is called num in Perl 6, and then uh, you could pass those. So that's about the only ugliness I saw there. Uh, the colors, yes, I stole that from some uh, I think a Wikipedia page about Tetris which uh, told us which were the official colors. <laughs> <laughs> so let's give it some realism. And, uh, okay. Uh, now, motion. I said that uh, yeah, you, uh, you can use a timer to animate the pieces, but they have to be drawn in places. But you can't just make them go all over the place. My first uh, bits of uh, running code here had the thing going off the screen. The pieces were going all over the place and into all sorts of unrealistic things. So to make sure that it's valid, um, I had to add methods like this. Uh, I remember Carl online saying, well, why are you using uh, capital letters to, uh, to name your methods? Uh, it was just because GTK was already doing that, and I didn't want to clash with their style, so it was just more of the same. 
Uh, but this kind of logic is there just to make sure that the proposed position of a piece is actually legal. It's a bit like checking the legal chess moves for a chess piece. Well, these are also pieces, and they can't just go anywhere. They mustn't overlap anything else. So there's a sort of tiling thing, and that's what Tetris is about. And um, it's, uh, it mustn't go beyond the boundaries of the, of the board either, which they call the matrix. So that's all <coughs> bits of code. And uh, there's another way, uh, another kind of move is uh, that users are allowed to spin the piece around. Uh, some games allow you to, re to rotate clockwise and anti-clockwise. I haven't got all that. So this is a more an impressionist uh, Tetris game rather than the full authentic thing. But uh, that's because I'm just playing that. And um, so, uh, yeah, I'd written far longer code. Um, and then uh, Stefan, writing Nietzsche, he looked at my code and said, but all that code is just a map. Yes. You're right, and there was yeah, there was a negative sign, which was the bit that made it not just a simple map, but it turned out that I was rotating pieces in this very clumsy, clunky way, and he said, just do it with the map. But well, that's, he was looking more in the abstract, and he just saw a pattern there, which I really loved. So that's a good optimization, and uh, yeah, that just returns uh, true or false. Then. <coughs> okay, um, the game itself. Then this is the um, uh, you could say the game's engine, and that's thank you. Um, is the logic, uh, which once you've seen the preceding code, it makes perfect sense. Uh, what I so love is that the GTK actually gives you the key stroke names. So these are things that you don't have to synthesize, they're just called that, and uh, everything on the keyboard has got a nice friendly name. So that's an easy way to uh, deal with those. And we'll just watch it, and that's the end of the talk. So we'll launch this one as well, and it's just that, but with Tetris. <coughs> And I get to play Tetris. <laughs> well, after some starting time. And it's the keyboard that does the work then. There we go. Okay. And so it's like that. And of course, my Tetris skills are still quite limited, but you can see the spinning and so on. Uh, what do we do with that? Spin it. And so on. Alright, so. Did you implement the removing of rows? Uh, yes, I'd better play that for you. <laughs> yeah, there's a bit more source code to it. Uh, well, I'm going to get another row to go. I need a long piece now, don't I? <laughs> so, I'm going to to yeah, there. Okay. there we go. Okay, so it's removing rows as well. And we'll leave it at that. Oops, what's happening there? <laughs> okay. Um, but the source code is here. And that's in that window. We'll just bigger that up a bit. Um, and so I've spoken about lots of that already, and uh, there's just a few bits in between to hang it all together. Um, and total total length is 164 lines, which is not too bad for a game. There is, yeah. Now would that be a bug? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm afraid I just didn't write that, and I can't be bothered. But if you are interested, you're very welcome to add patches because we'd love to uh, you know, do more of this kind of thing. Anyway, I very much enjoyed writing it, and I've uh, enjoyed talking about it. So that's it. Right, questions before we go and watch the later talks? Okay, right, questions.